<laughs> God's got something to do here. That's, that's what we're worried about. Um, as we jump into this morning, where's my water? Brian, can you bring my water, please? Yes. Right there, that, that's it. Yeah, I said it. Ooh. That does not look good. <laughs> can you guys see that? There's like, there's like stuff in here. This reminds me when my dad was a kid. He grew up in Pampa, and they had a, a water well that they would go and draw water from. Uh, this is like 1936, 1937. And he said there were times when they had to pull fingernails out of the well water. Can you imagine? Yeah, that's not good, right? Can you imagine if this was coming out of your tap? And I'm sure there have been days where this has come out of your tap or maybe out of your well water. I don't think you've had to pull fingernails out. That hasn't happened in a long time. But, but that's not worth even the drinking. That's like stuff inside. That's, that's, this is what people around the world deal with on a regular basis. That what they use to, to not only bathe and wash dishes and wash clothes, but what they drink is contaminated. And I would love to say it's in other parts of the world, but we've seen in our country that there's been issues with drinking water. This year for VBS, our students, our children, are partnering with World Vision to provide clean drinking water around the world. And so I'm going to start this year's offering off the blue for the boys. <laughs> Making it rain in here, but this is what we're doing. So each day I would tell you, bring money for clean water. This may be the only time the entire VBS event that the boys are in the lead, so cherish this. Okay, but remind your children every day to bring change to put in, and we're going to donate and partner with World Vision. Um, so we have VBS coming up. There are great things. We have a video at the end of our service to kind of show you what this week's going to look like. It's a lot different than we've done in years past, and that there's a, a little bit more energy, probably a lot more smoke will be in the room. There'll be things flying across the place. They'll be throwing vegetables and fruits and, and playing games and stuff, and our people are going to be connecting with our children, having discussion time. So if, if you have children, or if you know children, or if you see random kids on the street, uh, tell them to get signed up, come. We start Tuesday night. We'll be in the Family Center starting at 6.30. Um, it goes from 6.30 to 8.30 every night. And then Wednesday through Friday, we are back in this place um, to begin the process of VBS and to celebrate. Let me get some things set up here real quick. If you have your scriptures, open up to... Philippians chapter 1. So I want to go back in because the last few weeks we've been, this is like week number 7, that we've been talking about 35,000. I mean, what were some of the decisions you made this morning? What shoes to wear? Uh, how many times you changed socks or maybe tops matching bottoms and something you thought was ready and it, it wasn't clean or it wasn't back from the cleaners or, or it, somebody else borrowed it? I don't, I don't have that problem. I have the largest clothes in my house right now. And so nobody borrows my stuff. It's kind of good. There was a time when I would go in and there'd be certain things missing because my son would have a project at school. He had to give a speech or he'd have some concert. And, he'd have to, and so, you know, sometimes you look and... So what decisions did you have to make this morning? To eat breakfast or not to eat breakfast? To skip breakfast at home and come get a donut at church? Um, have a second frappuccino because you just that's the kind of Sunday morning we're dealing with. And so I wonder how many decisions you've made just this morning. On average, again, the average person makes about 35 thousand decisions in a single day and we've been looking as paul has been i tell you what can i get some can i get some clean water up here because this this just won't do and i know i'm gonna i'm gonna take a sip of this in a moment i may go down if that happens um but paul talks about the process thank you sweetie by making decisions and he says that there's a, a process here by which we have been influenced right he says love knowledge and discernment. He says those are things that are influencing us. And then he says choose things that are excellent. And then he talks about the outcome of that, the, the ethos or the ethics that come out of this, the benefit. And so we've been talking about that, but I want to go back in. I want to read this passage from, um, from Philippians. We're looking at chapter one. And maybe we won't have the, um, the clicker working today. If that's the case, then so be it. God can work without that. Yeah, you got it? Okay. So if you have your scriptures, just read along with me. We'll, we'll bring the scriptures up on screen, but we've been reading this for seven weeks, so maybe you have it memorized by now. So here we go. 
Starting in verse 9, Paul writes this to the church in Philippi. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now that last, that we're in verse 11 now, in the first part of that, look what he says. He says, if we are able to stand before Christ on the day that he comes, and, and we are blameless and we are pure, then there's something else that goes along. There's something else that happens, and it's this idea of filled with the fruit of righteousness. Now that is two things. One, it is the outpouring of something that's happening because of things happening internally, right? There are fruits that are being produced within us. Um... Anybody else want to come join me on stage? <laughs> I mean, we're, this is like the entire staff. We're just missing, you know, Shirley and Tim. I'm, you know, where's Sonia? Where's she at? She needs to get. So fruits can be a couple of things, but it's this idea that something is happening within us. When I was working as a student pastor in Virginia, um, there was this unique thing that happened. So the church was built, and there were two oddities. One, um, when they built the church, the plans... Oh, there we go. It's starting to rack up. The, the church, somehow, they looked at the orientation of the building, and they turned it sideways by accident. Okay, so they had the drawings professionally done, but, but people in the church were actually building the church. And we had a lot of contractors, so it wasn't like a bunch of hack jobs like me trying to build a frame house. But, but these guys were experienced. But somehow, when they were looking at the plans, they got turned, and where the front door should have faced the main road, the front door faced the woods. And where the, the back of the church would have protected the playground area, the playground area was now facing the busiest access point of our church. And kids running across the street in the busiest times of the day in, in like Frogger and traffic. And it was, a, it was a miracle in my time there. We didn't have any kind of accidents with children. And so that was one oddity. And it was kind of this weird thing that you saw the church and you'd pull up to the side and be looking into the woods and wonder what happened here. And, and we'd tell people the story. It was kind of this weird thing. The other thing that happened was they planted two fruit trees. Now, I'm, I'm not a, an arborist. I'm not a tree specialist. I'm not a farmer. I don't really deal well with the garden. If it grows on its own, great. So I can do dandelions and foxtails and chick, chickweed. But when it comes to trying to cultivate something, I struggle with that. But what I was told was these two fruit trees were plum trees. Now, if you saw them fall to the ground, they were only this big like the size of a golf ball, and most of that was the, the seed, the pit, and there was a little bit of fruit and skin around the outside of that pit. And so it wasn't good to eat. If you took a bite, it was really bitter, and it was hard to digest, and it wasn't good. But if you were playing dodgeball, it was the perfect thing to use to throw at your friends. And so we'd walk outside of church on a Sunday morning after church was done, and it would be like blood dripping off the walls because all the fifth graders would come up, and they'd grab as many plums as they could and just start throwing them at each other. And it was like hail hitting the house, and they were just really dark red. And when they hit, just enough juice would come flowing down. So the fruit tree was not being used what it was intended to be used for. It was being used as projectiles to hurt people. And the fifth graders loved it. And they'd go home and there'd just be blood dripping off of them. Sometimes it was really blood and sometimes it was just bad fruit juice. And I, and I wonder, why, why, why would their founding people of the church plant these trees here? I mean, what, were they, was it planted by fifth graders? Did they, did they project this, this was going to be a new church tradition for us? And the idea was that it got planted to produce fruit, but no one ever trimmed the trees. And so a lot of the energy that would go into growing the fruit was going into growing more branches and growing more leaves. And so it therefore never diverted energy to the fruit and it was never productive for what it was meant for. But it was, it was great for dodgeball, again. And I wonder if we understand when, when Paul writes in this, in this, this passage that, that there's this idea happening that filled with the fruit of righteousness, is that really happening in us? Has, the, has love and knowledge and discernment done its work in us? Are we standing in a place where we can choose the excellent things and are we choosing the excellent things? And then are we able to stand before Jesus Christ with our hearts revealing that he is our king and we've been living repentantly and we stand blamelessly? And if that's the case, then there's an outcome that comes from that. And it's, and it's this idea that righteousness is taking hold, that is being produced. Now, I think that's one part of the fruit that he's talking about here. But I think there's something else that comes from the, the righteousness. But I want you to see something key that Paul writes in this. And, it, and here it is. 
It only comes through Jesus Christ. It isn't the fruit that's produced in the righteousness of your own works. It isn't the fruit of righteousness that comes because of your family line. It isn't because of the righteousness that comes from, from the place you live. You, you have a home in the middle of Jerusalem. You live on, on the place where you can see the temple, and you, can, you go there on a daily basis. You walk by it. You can't attend, but, but maybe you are a priest. And, and that right, That's not what he says. He says, of all the things that may work, remember Paul is... He's a, he's a Jew of Jews. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knows the, the language. He knows the law. He knows the scriptures. But what he is saying is, is that righteousness that only comes through Jesus Christ. That only is understood in the context of having discernment that comes from knowledge that is born out of love. This only can take place if we choose the excellent things, being Jesus Christ first of all, and in doing the things that he did. Standing before him, ready to be judged and found acceptable. And then it comes and says, man, if that happens, and I pray, this is what Paul says, I pray this happens for you, that righteousness would be fruitful in your life that comes through Jesus Christ. You see, there's this great work that happens in the, in the aspect of choosing excellence. And it's the great work that's being done, but it's also the great work that's happening. And I wonder, in the past seven weeks, have you realized that it, as you've wrestled with some of your decisions in financial, relational, uh, business, maybe with your home, your family, your kids, your wife, your husband, maybe with whatever your resources may be, have you seen that as you choose the excellent things, influenced by spiritual things and influenced by the love of God and knowing scriptures, that things are changing? That things are different. Now, I don't know that you've stood before Christ yet, but he is examining you. Does this heart, do your heart belong to him? Is his heart your heart? Are, 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 have you had that moment this week where you chose the, the, the mediocre? You chose the debase, and you realized it, and you had to go back before Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Father, forgive me. I, I, I didn't do your will. I, I realized there was something different, something I should have chosen that was better, and I didn't do that. And, and maybe I didn't realize the moment, so forgive me for ignorance, or, or maybe I know it, and I chose to just be disobedient. Father, forgive me for disobedience. But if you're like me, you've probably had to pray a few repentant prayers this week. And that's okay. I mean, we want to pray fewer of those by the work of the Spirit. But, but it's okay to ask. That. That's what brings us blamelessly before Christ. But then we begin to see a great work that comes from choosing excellence. I'm going to dive into another passage of Scripture to help us understand this. If you have your Scriptures, I want you to turn very quickly to Galatians chapter 5. There's a lot of things that churches and people think the Spirit is all about, and, and, and a lot of those things are accurate. I'm not here to go through an exhaustive study of the Holy Spirit work. But when Paul says the fruit of the Spirit, I, I mean the fruit of righteousness, I think he's relaying back to this idea that he's also been talking to the church in Galatia, that there are certain things that the Spirit is present in your life will be produced out of you and be produced within you. And so beginning in, in verse 22, this is what Paul writes. But the fruit of the Spirit, see, he's been talking about other things, the debased things, the, the mediocre things, right? The things that tear us down and break our relationship. And then he starts in, in verse 22, but there's something different. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I mean, it's all wrapped up right here. He's like, you know, let's, let's go back. And if the Spirit exists in you, then these are the things that will be produced in your life. These are the fruits of righteousness, and it's peace, patience, love, joy, self-control, these, these things he talks about. And it's the Spirit living inside of you, and these things begin to take root. These things begin to be who you are. 
And so you can talk about a lot of things that are spiritual indicators, but if you're missing what Paul's talking about, then the Spirit is struggling to be an influence in your life and an agent of transformation. There's something else that is influencing you. And he says here in the end, he says, um, you know what, if, if you're going to walk with the Spirit, then, then put the desires of the flesh, which are revealed to you because of knowledge and discernment and the love of God. You have a desire to get rid of those things. He says, crucify those things. Lay them on the cross, nail them, and walk away. In the same way that the Romans tried to extinguish Christianity by killing Christ the Messiah, he says, it didn't work for that, but it will work for your sins. Let those things be crucified. And then what does he say? Realize that it's the work of God who does it. It's the Spirit's work within you. And he says, don't, don't become conceited. You ever thought to yourself, it's been five years since I last barked at the moon. And bark at the moon can be whatever sin you're struggling with. And you think for a moment, that's good. Man, I've been working hard. I've got my, my guys who pray over me. I'm reading scripture on a regular basis. My wife and I are having great conversations. And I've, I, put, I put them on the cross. It's gone. I got rid of it. At that moment, you may have sacrificed one sin on the cross, but there's another fleshly desire that's taking its place because you didn't do squat. Other than placing it on the cross, it was the power of Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, the revelation of God that did the work for you. You just got to enjoy it. Now, you had to participate by placing it there, but they're the ones who took it. And so he says, in this moment where you begin to understand that the Spirit and the fruit is, is being born in you and it's taking over, don't forget that there is something greater at work in you, that you are not responsible for this. But you have to participate. But look at what he says here. Not only being con conceited, but he says, provoking one another. And you want to know a great struggle in the American church? I don't struggle with language. It's not a deal for me. Maybe when I was like middle school, it, it was an issue, and, and, but it's not an issue for me. It doesn't bother me, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not addicted to it. it I don't have to communicate that way. But if I'm not careful, guess what I'll do? I will hear somebody else speak that way, and I'll become really self-righteous. I don't think you love Jesus Christ enough to use that kind of language. You, you should be more like me. Now, I may not use those words, but I sure think those thoughts. Why can't you just give it up like I did? Why don't you use better words like I use? And what happens is, is that we cast that judgment on someone, and we begin to provoke each other, not encourage. This isn't a building word. This isn't a something that talks about bearing with each other. This talks about provoking, poking, causing strife. And then he says, what about this one? Envying one another. Man, I wish I had the ability to pray like that person. Man, if I could pray like them, my prayer life would be so on fire right now. I would want to hear myself pray all the time if I prayed like I love to hear their prayers. I just want to gather over and sit in their section because we do some prayer time. Then I want to hear their prayers. And, and when we do some prayer on Wednesday nights, I want to be close to them because I love to hear that. I wish I had that. I wish I had the gift and ability to teach a class like this. I'm, I, you know that there are people who have envied. patient with their spouse. I wish, I, I wish, right? Who are they praying for? They're praying for that person to influence. They want their gifts instead of realizing that what God has gifted them for and what God has chosen to give them is the greatest gift they could ever receive. We don't need to be like each other. We don't need to be provoking each other. That is contrary to the fruits of the spirit and that is in line with conceitedness. The fact that I think that I could choose what gifts that I want. And I could demand from God that he give me the gifts I think are the best. There's a scene in, in a movie where it talks about abolition and John Newton is, is pastoring a church. And you don't, don't know who John Newton is. He's the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. Now, he did not author the original version. Amazing Grace was already in publication. He took it and he rewrote it and added the version that most of us know today. The classic tune.
William Wilberforce, who is going to put forth a bill before House and Parliament to end slavery in England. thing on its tattered and he's mopping the floors of the church. That was his calling. And for, for William Wilberforce to be envious of him that he had such a simple job that he could focus on and become really good and have peace and quiet would have been wrong because then abolition never would have happened and slavery would still be an issue. Even in the states because of his work we have we have the way he did would have been catastrophic for the church. The gifts that you are given, the spiritual fruit that's happening inside of you, be thankful and crave it. And so this morning as we talk about making decisions, I want you to understand that in this what we see is that decisions that you make reveal fruit. And there are two aspects of the fruit that I want us to look at this morning that we see that Paul is talking about in both places. And it's the idea that as we stand before Jesus Christ and as we, as we make these excellent decisions, that this fruit of righteousness will take place and these things that he talks about with self-control and kindness and love and peace and patience, that these things will begin to flourish within us. And the fruit is then revealed in how we make decisions and the decisions we make. The first fruit is this that God's great work is happening within you. Saints, can you, can you stand here this morning and can you think back to what you used to do in your old life before you knew Jesus or when you were a brand new Christian and some of the decisions you made which were really catastrophic and, and dangerous, but you don't make those decisions anymore. Maybe the language you use is more edifying and building up. Maybe the way you handle sins with other people is you begin to pray and you want to walk with them and help bear those sins with them. Maybe the, the, the mom who's fallen out of social graces and you want to walk and pray and, and treat her with kindness. And maybe the husband who's made some serious mistakes and has done some very damaging things to his family, you want to encourage and you want to, you want to do some discipleship. Where, where when you were younger, you would have avoided that at all costs. I can't be associated with it. It makes me look bad as a Christian. And that's not the Christ-like attitude. The Christ-like attitude is you step into those moments with spiritual wisdom and discernment and knowledge and love, but, but you handle it differently. And I pray that you sit here this morning and you can look back and see that God has been working in great ways within you. That the things you used to struggle with, they're not, not, not that big of a struggle anymore. They're still dangerous, but, but you keep a spiritual watch and you have people that pray over you and you sacrifice those things and those desires come up, you lay them back at the cross. That maybe this morning you got up to get ready for church and, and you spoke kindly to your spouse. That's, that's some of God's greatest work within us. The people who are closest to us are the ones we usually give the least amount of patience and kindness to. I don't know why it's that way. We were, I was having a conversation the other day that it's just crazy that some of the things that seem so common sense, that how we resolve conflicts and arguments and, and how we, we have our needs discussed and, and how we treat those who are closest to us would seem that we would work those things out for a mutual benefit, but oftentimes we, we resolve those things to win the argument, to destroy the other person so that I can win. And in the ultimate aspect, when I do that, what happens? I lose in the greatest way that I could ever think of. But that didn't happen this morning. This morning in the conflict, I was, all of a sudden I was a little bit patient. And, and my wife was patient with me, and, and, and we could see that God was doing some great things. That my kids, who, who I struggle with their decisions, I'm seeing that God is doing something inside of them, and the decisions they make are, are not just about them, but about other people. Not just about me trying to please Dad for, for a, a few dollars for a night out, but, but they're, they're choosing things that are kingdom significant that my coworkers, that there's something happening, that the conversations that they're, ha they're having are, have to do about spiritual things of faith and consequence. And there is a good, fruitful work happening inside of them. 
Now, I do believe that that fruitful work can begin before a person believes in Jesus Christ, but I think that work is to reveal their need for Jesus Christ. But as Christians, we begin to see these things. And I hope and pray that somebody who has been a discipler for you and a mentor can come to you and say, hey, you know what? I'm seeing really incredible things happen with you. God is doing something in you that's amazing. I don't know if your spouse has ever said that to you. And if you're a husband or a wife this morning, don't placate, don't fake it. But if you've seen some changes, little minor change things, you may still have a laundry list of of grievances and hurts and pain. This is kind of where we stop. This is what we pray for. God, change me. God, God, put this inside. Renew in me. Let me be this. I want to know you. I want to feel you, Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit move because I want to feel this today. I want to experience this. I want to be a part of it. Change me. But that is an immature fruit. That's the the plum hanging from the tree that has no fruit around it. It has no benefit to anybody. There's a little bit of benefit, but it's not reached its full potential because the other work of greatness that's happening that's a fruit is not just within you, but then it begins to pour out. But I want you to listen to what Paul says, yes, to the church in Corinth. And when he writes them, I want you to listen, he says, for our sake, because of what was in our condition, he says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus, who was perfect, became sin. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The fruits of righteousness come from you deciding to put yourself in the right place, to be planted in the right soil, but it is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and God working in you. And he did that when he became sin on the cross. And so when Paul says, take those fleshly desires and put those on the cross, it's because that's where Jesus took sin upon himself, was on the cross, for the sole purpose that you would become the righteousness of God. Righteousness is simply defined as the right actions. And when you believe and you live and you grow and you become more Christ-like, then you are fulfilling the righteousness of God played out right here in your life in this this one-act drama. But it's incomplete if we stop there. Because in this, the work that's happening in you needs to have another fulfillment. And here it is. It's the fruit of God working through you. So when the things begin to happen inside of you, then there's an outpouring to the people around you and to the situations and the environments, the places that you live, in your home, in your work, in your neighborhood, the church you attend. Here. See, it isn't just enough, and I'm not saying that you're incomplete, but but you're immature if it only happens in you. But when work that happens in you begins to pour out and come through you, then spiritual fruit, righteousness, begins to take shape in a different way. The boss who prays over his employees before the day begins, it's because he understands how important it is to have intercessory prayer. Because where does Jesus sit? At the right hand of God. And what does he do? He intercedes for us as the high priest. If I'm going to become like Christ, I should be doing the same thing. But I'm not going to intercede for Jesus because he's perfect. I don't need to intercede for the Holy Spirit. He's he's helping me pray. But my workplace is a pretty rough place. I don't know. In the last two years, how many times I've heard, pardon me, pastor, for my language, I work in the oil field. It's a rough place. Pardon me, Pastor, I'm a teacher. I work at the high school. (laughs) This is a rough place. I think the high school and the oil field kind of have a similar language. (laughs) (laughs) So you, as a believer, know how important it is for you to intercede and pray for those people around you. Your house is a place of conflict, maybe. 
And so it's not just enough that you understand how important prayer is and how much it's changed you, but you begin to take on the understanding of what it means to be the high priest in the places that you live, that you're called to be the saint, and you walk in, set apart, and you pray for your people. My question for you is, in this work that God is doing through you, do you speak more out of provoking and envy, or do you begin with prayers? Because I got to tell you, I, I still struggle with people's selfish behaviors. When someone cuts in front of me, you know, the whole traffic thing, I know it doesn't happen often here, but when you go to Amarillo, it's like nonstop traffic, right? And so when you're getting into that place where the lanes are coming down and you're, you're trying to let people in and that one person like scoots around on the shoulder and tries to get two or three cars ahead, and then what do you want to do? You want to like follow behind them and like pin them up against the wall like it's NASCAR and teach them a lesson. I'll show you how, to, how are we going to do this. I wish I was driving a semi. And there are times I've celebrated when I've watched the semis in front of me see this happening. What do they do? They begin to pull over the shoulder and squeeze that person back a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus Christ is in the moment. <laughs> honk, honk, honk. Maybe for us, it's at the grocery store, and, and, I, and I go to walk up, and there's two of us walking towards the line of five people, which is like unthinkable at United, that they would ever allow five people to be staying in line. But you're walking towards, and all of a sudden, you begin to notice each other, and you walk a little faster, right? And then that person jumps in, and they scoot in in front of you. And you lay hands on them. Dear Jesus, forgive this person's <laughs> selfishness. Let them understand my humility and letting them go before me. Right? No wonder do we, do we wrestle with these things in such a way that all of a sudden begins to change, right? And the work that's happening through you, you begin to pray before you ever get to those situations. Give me an opportunity today to choose excellence. Because I know that you're doing some amazing things in me, but I want that to flow out. I want that to erupt. I want it to be like too much chocolate milk on a birthday cake. Right? I've eaten an entire half of a cake for myself, and then I drink too much chocolate milk, and what happens? The overflow. You know, I, I want the spiritual work to be that same way. I don't want to pray that you would keep me safe. I want you to pray and give me boldness. Give me awareness that I know when to say something. Let me pray for that first. Give me a chance to understand how to handle sin. My own sin to begin with, because there's a lot of shame and guilt and, and retribution there. I punish myself for some things rather than just plead for forgiveness and ask for spiritual forgiveness and, and spiritual growth. But help me to understand how to handle other people's sins too, because it's what I'm called to do. I'm called to bear that. And sometimes I forget bearing means to help carry, and I think it means to attack someone. I'm going to bear on you right here, right now. That's the work happening through you. This is the father who prays over his family and provides the shade for growth. The father who serves his family and washes their feet. The father who serves his family by providing and seeing it as his spiritual duty and spiritual opportunity to provide for his family. This is the mother who tells her husband, Thank you. I know you work hard. Sometimes it's like a, a thankless thing, but you do such a great thing for us as a family. You don't need to qualify that either. Look, I know you're really a big butthead, but thank you so much for having a great job. Don't qualify that. Just, just speak the kindness for the moment. There will be the, the other conversations later. You have to deal with some of all the got husbands and wives all looking at each other. I don't know if it's because I said a bad word or because you guys have said that today already. <laughs> but it's the mom who, who does the chores of the house and, and as she folds those socks and, and underwear that are questionable, that you pray over them. It, it's kids who, who realize that their parents do a lot of things for them that they never talk about. And when they say that that's not who we are as a family, it's because they have a greater vision and want to see something better. Right? That's, that's the work happening through, and that's something that we have to pray for. I want you to listen to what Paul also says to the church in Ephesus. He says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Now, that's for him. 
That's a change of, of stealing, which brings condemnation and shame to becoming productive, what he, was, what he was created to do. But then listen to what it says, and only is it work happening to him, so that what? So that he may collect for himself riches and hoard those things in a closet and never share them with anyone. Oh, that's the wrong version. No, it says this, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The work happening in him brought about the work happening through him. That's what choosing excellence does. That's what standing before Christ, pure and blameless, does for us. We get to enjoy those things. And so I want to encourage you as you, as you step out of here this week, are you going to be making these decisions in such a way that you test them against your knowledge and the discernment and love you have for God, and that you're going to choose to do excellent things that let you stand before Christ, pure and blameless, but then begin to show that there's spiritual fruit that's happening within inside of you, and that that spiritual fruit is good for other people. It isn't the plums that you throw at people and they have to dodge and they get hit, there's pain. It's the plums that are ripe and, and beautiful and fruitful and soft and sweet and succulent. You bite into it and, and, and the juice flows, right? And it's, it's the perfect sweetness. M maybe an apricot and a peach can, can rival the taste of a, of a really good ripe plum. And the fruit that's being produced inside of you, if it doesn't go to the place where it flows through you to other people, then you don't fully understand the life that Christ has set aside for us. Because he demonstrated that on the cross, there was fruit being produced. And it was ugly, but it was sweet. It was painful, but it was perfect. And so the Spirit is cultivating that fruit inside of you. And it may be the culture in your home. It may be the way that you treat your neighbors. It may be the way you collect and spend your money and resources. It may be the way that you work. It may be the way that you manage. It may be the way that you do homework. It may be the way that you, you treat your family inside the house and outside the house. Whatever that fruit may be, it's going to prove one of two things. That either you're a fruit that's not good for eating, and it's good just to be thrown around as trash, or it's going to be something that other people want to take part of. And when they taste, they don't taste you. They don't understand you. They don't get you. What do they get? Jesus Christ. Flowing through you. John writes in the beginning as he starts his book, the book of John. He says that Jesus came and he lived among us. He dwelt among us. And we believe in Jesus and become like him. Guess what? We represent Jesus among us. Not just on Sunday mornings. Now, I'm grateful that you guys are kind of nice to each other on Sunday mornings. It's all handshakes and hugs and kisses. But it's also with your neighbors, the guy who doesn't mow his yard, the guy who doesn't tend to his car, the guy whose kids are, you, you name it. Demonstrate fruit in that moment. The key is this, is that this righteous fruit comes from a very important source. And it's a righteous connection. A tree planted in bad soil cannot produce the fruit it was intended to produce. A, a tree that's planted in good soil that isn't intended to will not produce the fruit it was meant to produce. But you put the tree in the right situation with the right care, and it will blossom. And guess what it does? It reproduces itself. And so the plum tree then gives birth to more plum trees. And, and a single tree can become an orchard. And a single tree that can provide for a person or a small family can then provide for a, a whole village or a whole community. And what is that righteous connection? Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You want to understand spiritual fruit? Get connected. If you think you can find that connection without reading scripture, then you don't know Jack. You definitely don't know Jesus. If you think you can be productive and have spiritual fruit and righteousness be a part of your life, but you don't spend time in prayer, then you don't get it. If you think you'll never have doubts, but you never engage in the Christian life where, where it talks about giving to orphans and giving to, to widows and taking care of those in need, then you're not understanding what this life is about and you're missing out on the benefits of the fruit. And that fruit sometimes is what is produced in us, but it's also enjoying the fruits that are produced through us. 
And we begin to see someone who we have a connection with begin to bear fruit for others. They become a tree that the birds come and land in. And people find shade, and they find comfort, and they find sustenance, and they grow. And they replant themselves. And more and more disciples and more and more spiritual fruit bears witness and bears out into the world when the Spirit begins to change this culture and change the city. You're going to leave here today, and I'm going to tell you, be desperate that there's spiritual fruit. Ask, talk to the people who are closest to you and ask the dangerous question of all time. Do you see righteousness? Do you see Christ's likeness in me? And don't, don't try to qualify. I mean, I know that Tuesday was bad, but do you see? I know that I had a bad, rough day at work and I came home. I, I know that the house blew up on, on Thursday and I know this is kind of a rough day for us. <laughs> don't qualify. Just ask the question, do you see the spiritual fruits of righteousness? Do you see Christ's likeness in me? And if they say yes, be honest. Give them some specifics. But if it's not there, don't hide it. Oh, you're a good person. I know you're trying really hard. No, do it with love and encouragement. Push them back into the scriptures. Push them back into prayer. Push them back into fellowship with other people who are fruit producers so that we can then cultivate something that changes this city. I hope you are proud of your house, but your house will never save anyone. I love my grass in my front yard. I didn't plant it. I didn't really nurture the soil. I'm just keeping it going. Somebody else did that for me, and I get to, to you know, reap the benefits. But my grass will never save anyone. My couches and, and my decor. But I have Jesus Christ to talk about, and he changes lives forever. That is a great fruit that is in you that needs to come out of you into others. And so I encourage you this week, pray that God would give you a chance to have spiritual righteousness and that fruit produce in you. Let's pray. Father, this morning, what I hope we find is this encouragement that there are great things that lay in wait for us if we will live obediently. If we live in repentance and our heart belongs to you and you are the king of us, that, that Father, these excellent choices will condition us and the conditions of soil and great things come out that we get to enjoy. When there's a righteous life, people notice it. And sometimes they fight against it because of how the, of the revelation of their own lacking ability and understanding of who Jesus Christ is. But for the most part, people respect that. We get to benefit. We get your joy and your pleasure and your happiness with us. Father, we know that that changes marriages. We know it changes children changes families and households. It changes neighborhoods. And Father, we pray as a church the decisions we make would change this city. And that more than just being about a church that has a nice building with some pretty comfortable seats and some great music and, and some nice staff people, and, and it's a great place, but Father, it's more about programming, but it's a, it's a church of people who are hungry, seeking after you, who are talking about you on a regular basis, that spiritual things are happening because the people here because you're working through them, because of the work you've done in them. And so, Father, may we go this week on mission to have the fruit that's been producing within us, that it would also flow through us, and that we would be generous to other people. Thank you, Father, that you give us that promise and that that is possible, that we can enjoy that kind of life. Church, this morning... I'm going to offer two things as we go into our prayer time. Our prayer team is going to come up and I'm going to ask him to give you two things. One is to come and give thanks for those fruit things that are happening, that you're recognizing that there's work happening in you and you've noticed that there are some things happening around you and God's been using you in those things to do some incredible work. But there are some of you who are struggling because you think that this fruit thing is hindered because there's pain and loss and grief and misery. Right? It's, it's like the, the soil conditions aren't just right for that fruit to take place. Do you think if God would relieve some of these things from you, that, that then, then the fruit would take off, and that's not how it works. So maybe you need to come down this morning and just pray that someone would pray over you and ask God for healing. 
And this is a great place. This isn't more sacred of a place, but it is an incredible time for you to acknowledge that God can heal. And there are people up here who want to pray over you. So I would tell you, if there's anything, if you're going to pray for somebody else who has a need for healing, then come down this morning. But maybe you need to come down this morning and just say, I'm going to pray that God would just produce the fruit in me that would be so big that it would break the, the framework. Then it would just be flowing and flowing and flowing and people would have incredible benefits from this, not because of me, but because of what God is doing. You want to know what that looks like? That's the life of Kenny Wooster, right? I, I think I've told you this. There have been conversations with people in our church and our community and I'll ask them, hey, so why do you attend CWC, Kenny Wooster? Like you worship Kenny Wooster? No. But he worships Jesus Christ. And he encouraged me, encouraged me, and prayed over me, encouraged me, and had conversations with me. And I came to church and I found something incredible. I found Jesus Christ. That is a fruitful life. That is a huge tree that casts a lot of shade for a guy who's like five foot tall. That is like a huge cedar, an elm. And I'm not saying I want to be like, like Kenny Wooster. I can't, I can't get there. Physically, I can't get there. But I want Jesus Christ to be that kind of influence through me. And so I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. And I'm going to encourage you this morning, don't sit in your seats. We have plenty of time. We have a baptism coming up in a few minutes. we got some announcements to close out. we got a VPS volunteer meeting coming to here in, in, after church for about 20 minutes. But let's not leave this moment until we've had a chance to engage our Father through the Holy Spirit by the intercession of Jesus Christ to pray for healing or to pray for forgiveness or to give thanks for the fruit that's being produced. And so I'm going to encourage you to stay in this moment and respond to God as he leads you. But let's stand let's, let's do this together. You may be sitting there in your seat thinking, oh, I can't make it up to the front. All the prayer people are taken. You need to turn to the person next to you. Every person who believes in Jesus Christ is a prayer warrior, a prayer saint, called by God to do some incredible things. So this isn't the magical place up front. So grab each other and start praying over each other. finish up this morning's service before we close in prayer I want to invite you just to, to spend a moment in your seats and pray over this next week with VBS that the gospel will be presented in such a way that the spirit will reveal to kids in their hearts that they want to follow Jesus Christ 
and some of these kids will be sitting in the exact same seats that you're in. So just take a moment and pray for VBS this week. So, Father, we are grateful that this process of, of making decisions and choosing excellent things it doesn't have its, its end in simply making a decision, but, Father, there are incredible benefits, the great work that happens in us and through us. And so, Father, thank you for that. Thank you that we get to benefit, and that benefit brings us back into relationship and get to enjoy you even more and more deeply and more often. We are grateful for that. So, Father, I pray for us as a church that we would be fruit-bearing people because of our connection through Jesus Christ. And we know that apart from him, we can do nothing. And so, Father, I pray that we stay connected. And so thank you for what you do through us. And we pray for the days to come that the, as children come and sit in these seats and as Jerry comes and presents the gospel this week for our VBS that that, Father, there would be great moments of decisions that children would put their faith and trust in you because of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for knowing our brokenness and the healing that we need. Sometimes it's just a word of encouragement. Sometimes it's a word of, of discipline. And so, Father, thank you for being our Father. And now we walk out of here on mission. People who have heard the gospel preached have read it, seen the scriptures. Father, the Spirit has been speaking to our hearts. May we walk out of here with that message and have conversations with people and talk about who Jesus Christ is. We pray these things in his name. Amen.